Hello, good people. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Praise the Lord. I hope you're doing okay wherever you are. Welcome to our installment today. God is good all the time and all the time God is good. I'm um, a little behind today, but I thank God for the grace to get started and trust him that he will see us through everything for today. We are still in our series of walking by faith. Today is installment number 10. I think last Sunday I said it was number eight, but I went back and double checked. We were on nine. So today is 10. Let's pray. Father, we love you and bless your name today. Thank you for yet again an opportunity to come on air to share your word, a powerful word that is able to save us, to keep us, to encourage us, to equip us, even to live a life that pleases you in the world around us. We thank you and thank and honor you for the grace operating in our lives. We give you all the glory and the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, dear ones, let's get started running behind today. But by God's grace, we are favored and we are going to come through. Thank you for the feedback. Those who are telling me it is clear. It's good to go. God bless you, sweet ones. Um, so walking by faith. Today we are talking about a more excellent sacrifice. And I know... Um, we started off in Hebrews uh, 11, read a little bit of that earlier in the series. And now uh, for the next few weeks, thank you, husband Mark, for letting me know of that. For the next few weeks, I know um, we'll spend some time talking about all, if the Lord wills, uh, all the different um, uh, characters mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11. And we're going to learn a thing or two from every one of them and see why it is that they are listed as champions of faith in a chapter that's dedicated to talking about faith. And so the very first person listed, if I'm not mistaken, is a gentleman by the name of Abel, right? We know his story. Uh, and if you're not familiar with that, I'll quickly send you to Genesis chapter 4 from about verse 1 on down to about 10, 11, thereabouts. So take your time, go there, Genesis chapter 4, 1 through about 11 or 10. You can get his story there. We might get some time to go through some of it, but if not, that's where the story is. Um, he is listed in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 4, and it says, By faith. Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and through it, he being dead still speaks. So God, in his word, teaches us about Abel. He is the second born of the first human family. Adam and Eve gave birth to Cain, and the second child was Abel, and then the third one was Seth, at least the sons. We don't know about daughters. Cain was the oldest son, and he was a, a, a farmer, if you will. He raised crops. Abel, on the other hand, he loved to keep sheep, so he was a, like a livestock keeper. Well, as you would imagine, God required of them to give sacrifice as a way of worship, just like he requires of us to give sacrifice as our way of worship to him. And he sets an example for us, even in him giving Jesus Christ to be the sacrificial lamb to deliver us from sin. He sets the example, right? And, and so... I imagine that every, I don't know, maybe the first day of the week or maybe every so often as you, you know, you come down in the, in the uh, book of Numbers and Leviticus and Deuteronomy, you know, it speaks of the different sacrifices that the people of God gave. And so I imagine that at whatever appointed day or time they would go deliver 
their sacrifice as a way of worship to God. And so this one day they go to give their offerings and Cain's offering is not accepted. The Bible actually says God did not respect the offering of Cain, but he respected the offering of Abel. What is it about Abel's sacrifice that God loved and respected and testified of to an extent that is included in a chapter of champions of faith, right? So, so the, the story, like I mentioned, is in Genesis 1, you know, 4, 1 to 10. And maybe I'll just read there real quick. Now, Adam knew his knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. Then she bore again, this time his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought the, off the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. So notice verse 4. Abel also brought the firstborn. That's characteristic number one. He is giving God the firstborn of his flock and their fat. It's not just any firstborn. It is the fattened one. It is the best of the flock. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering. God did not just respect Abel, the person giving the offering, but also respected the offering itself. And as we've learned here, it was the first born of his flock. It was the very best given that it was the fatted ones. But he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry. So the fact that God does not respect Cain's offering makes him angry. But the fault was not because he was not accepted. The fault of Cain preceded the sacrifice that he presented to the Lord. It was the nature of his heart. Remember, giving is from the heart, right? Over in, in 2 Corinthians um, chapter uh, uh, Second Corinthians nine, I believe, verse eight. Uh, let me see. Second Corinthians nine six through about eight. There it says, "But this I say: He who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will reap bountifully." So let each one give as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity for God loves a cheerful giver and God is able to make all grace abound toward you that you always having all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for every good work. So the, the, the position at which we stand or a place of understanding that we start with before giving the offering is what God is looking at for, for, Abel, it was a place of gratitude. It was a place of thanksgiving. It was a place of total honor for God. And he says, God, you have given me these flocks. So I'm going to give you the very best of it. I'm going to give you the first and I'm going to give you the best. Abel knows to honor his God in the way he sacrifices. He acknowledges that if it wasn't for the Lord, I wouldn't have any of this. And so it's no big thing for me to give the very best to the one who has given me all that I have. That's where Abel is coming from. Cain, on the other hand, we are not given a full description of his offering. But his condition of the heart preceding his sacrifice comes into question. Right? Right? And, and not only that, you know, God warns him, even as he has given this mediocre of a sacrifice, God takes time to tell Cain something. He says, Cain, why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, 
you will you not be accepted if you're doing the right thing will you not be accepted if you do not do well guess what sin is at your door and sin desires to have rule over you but you need to rule over it the way we give our offering and the type of offering we give to our god either opens the door for righteousness as it did for abel or it opens the door for sin as it did for cain the condition of your heart and the condition of your sacrifice will lead you either down the path of righteousness or the path of sin there is a consequence of our giving and our sacrifice to the lord sacrifice is not just about or giving to the lord is not just about reaching in my pocket pulling out something and dropping into the offering plate you have to give with the understanding and the awareness that this offering is going to bring something back to me a it will bring righteousness or b it will bring sin offering we we'll love to say sowing and as we just read out of the book of Corinthians there second Corinthians 9 it says you are sowing in your giving there is not a farmer who goes out drops seed in the ground and does not expect a harvest every time you are putting that seed in the offering basket you have to do it with the understanding that it's going to bring something back to your life this is walking by faith it may not be evident at the time it may seem minuscule at the time it may seem to be just something we do out of tradition in our many churches but let me help us today your offering your giving is a seed it will bear fruit back into your life is it going to be a fruit of righteousness or is it going to be a fruit of sin I mean I'm I'm sorry to say but so many of us as believers have sown sin back into our lives. We've sown ingratitude back into our lives. We've sown murder into our lives. That's what Abe, uh, Cain did right here. He literally planted seeds of murder. Literally. He put his offering before the Lord, but the condition of his heart yielded back into his life the spirit of anger and murder and he killed his own younger brother what a tragedy how unfortunate and we need to learn from this offering is not just money you drop quickly in a basket and watch it go away sometimes i watch people you know when they put those miserable looking cats and dogs on the tv and they're asking for some aid or they put on pictures see i'm from africa i can talk about this they put the pictures of poor africans on tv you know hey not every african is poor let me just make that clear the god of america the god of asia the god of, of the uk is the same god in africa we have different dynamic forces happening in the different parts of the world but it the same god who prospers america prospers africa you have to just open your eyes and see but i digress back to the point when they put these pictures in front of us and some of us do it out of necessity i mean it's good to give but but that is not that should not be the driving force behind your giving in fact it would be so nice that we would give ahead so that there's never that necessity but i know the bible says the poor will always be with you right so it's utterly impossible to eradicate poverty until jesus comes i know that but but here's the thing if you're simply giving out of necessity you're not going to reap the blessings the rich excellent blessings back into your life because we read we just read that second corinthians chapter 9 somebody correct me maybe it's first corinthians oh lord but anyway chapter 9 it says let everyone give as he has purposed in his heart don't wait to see an impoverished child's picture to give 
Don't wait to see a, an emaciated dog picture for you to give. Let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly. Some of us give grudgingly, not of necessity. Some of us give from necessity. But the Bible says God loves a cheerful giver. Sometimes I wonder when they were walking to go give their offering, you know, was Abel one of those that was dancing and celebrating before the Lord, rejoicing at the goodness of the Lord and saying, hallelujah, the Lord has blessed me. He has given me the increase of my flock and he is jubilating and dancing before the Lord. And meanwhile, his brother, his older brother Cain is standing over in the corner and saying, God owns the whole world. Why in the world does he want my corn? Why does he want my mango? Yes, the Bible says God owns heaven and earth and the sea and the fullness thereof. The cattle on the thousand hills is his. But the reason he asks of us to give is for us to learn the importance of sowing and reaping. He doesn't need us. He doesn't need our money. Silver and gold belongs to him. He created all these things. You should read in Isaiah. Is it Isaiah 1, 11 to 20? He is rebuking these people. He says, to what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices to me? Says the Lord. I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed cattle. I do not delight in the, bull, in the blood of bulls or of lambs or goats. This is the God we're talking about. He does not take delight in the blood of bulls. He's not a God who delights in the fat of cattle. He only does that as a reflection. He only delights in the condition of the heart behind the sacrifice. That's why he'll accept the sacrifice of one and yet another comes to give the exact same thing and will not accept that. Why? The condition of the heart. Are you giving from a place of faith? Lord, I trust you. Lord, I believe in you. Lord, I'm walking in the light of your word. I will follow every precept of your word. Or are we giving begrudgingly and giving compelled by necessity? If Cain would have been wise... At least when the Lord warned him and said, look, sin is waiting at your door and it will rule over you unless you take caution. Cain, had he been wise, he would have taken caution or precaution, right? But he didn't. He actually, I don't know how long between when they gave the offering and when they went out again to the fields, but he picked up a fight with his brother and overpowered him, of course, being older, and killed his brother. And then watch this. When the Lord, you know, the Lord sees this. And let me just say something. I know times, sometimes we wonder, or I've had people ask me, if God is all powerful, all great and all, why does he allow evil in the world? Because... Sometimes God has to let the sin in somebody's life mature before he can judge it. If God would have told Cain, murder is in your heart, Cain would have argued. He said, no, you're lying. Why would you say murder is in my heart from my offering? How is that possible? But God allowed this sin in Cain's life to mature, to, to reach its fullness. Elsewhere in scripture, he says, the sins of the Amorites and Ammonites, uh, Am Ammonites, I guess, has not fully matured. That's why he didn't judge, prejudge them. He didn't judge them ahead of time. And that's exactly what's happening in our world today. When you look around and it's all is evil and we're all crying to the Lord, please, Lord, come back, come back. We're ready for you. Come back. The Lord is watching. He's waiting for some of this sin to mature. And that's why I encourage people. I'm like, 
don't don't be surprised when things keep getting harder and harder, more and more evil. It's maturing. So then when the Lord finally judges this sin, nobody can say you judged me prematurely. He's a wise God. He's a wise God. He will let the sin mature. So anyway, Cain over here, he says, uh, I mean, he, after he kills his brother, God comes to him and says, where is Abel, your brother? And he arrogantly says, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? Oh, brother, are you kidding me? You are the oldest brother and you could care less where your younger brother is? Of course, the Lord knew Cain had killed Abel and he says, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Let me say something here. It is a principle of the word of God. Innocent blood touching the ground, being spilled, cries for vengeance before the Lord. It is a principle from eternity to eternity. Blood speaks. Innocent blood speaks. Even the blood of Jesus which was innocent blood shed, spoke. And one blood can speak judgment, the other can, uh, can, can speak forgiveness. And we are given this parallel, again, in the book of Hebrews, chapter 12, verse 24, it says, To Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the, you know, he's talking about, we have come to the mountain of Zion. We have come to the city of the living God. We've come to a good uh, general assembly. And on down to 24, he says, we have come to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. So both blood, whether innocent or, or, or of innocent people or not, it will speak. And some blood cries for judgment, some blood cries for forgiveness. The blood of Jesus speaks better things. It says, God have mercy. It says, wipe away their sin. It says, please forgive them. That's what the blood of Jesus speaks. The blood of Abel, on the other hand, was crying for vengeance. It was crying for judgment upon Cain and upon the ground that opened up its mouth to drink his blood. Sometimes we have to go before God and repent for the innocent blood that has been shed by us or by people around us. Sometimes we have to go before the Lord and the only thing that will silence that blood is the blood of Jesus. We have to plead the blood of Jesus over any other blood that is speaking over us or over our ground, over our homes, over our children. We have to counter the message of the accusatory and judgmental blood by the forgiveness blood of Jesus Christ. So Cain's blood is speaking even though he's dead. And that's what the Lord says here. As he's giving testimony about Abel. He says that even though Abel was dead, his blood was still speaking. Why? Because he gave a better sacrifice. He was innocent. His heart was pure. Have you given a sacrifice from a place of purity, from a place of thanksgiving and faith to the Lord? Such that that speaks for you better things. That sacrifice can acquire righteousness for you as it did for Abel. Where is your hope and my hope? I'll tell you mine. My hope is nowhere other than the blood of Jesus. My trust is in nothing else other than the blood of Jesus. Why? Because this is the blood by which I attain righteousness. This is the blood that speaks better things over me. This is the blood that counters every other judgmental thing in my life. 
And in Romans 3, 22, it says, our righteousness is by faith. In Jesus Christ. Our righteousness is by faith in Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 2 and 5, it says, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Jesus Christ. In Jesus Christ. So everything we give, it's only excellent if it's done from a place of faith in the blood of Jesus Christ. It's only excellent when it is standing on the faith in Jesus Christ. It can only speak better things when it is mingled with the blood of Jesus Christ. It can only acquire and assure righteousness for us when it is mingled with the blood of Jesus Christ. I think I've gone longer than I intended to. I'm going to stop there. But we're talking about as believers, taking the example of Abel, to give a more excellent sacrifice. God does not delight in our, our dollars, our shillings, our, our rubies, our gold and silver, your Bitcoin. God is not interested in that. He is interested in the condition of your heart toward him. He is interested in you finding righteousness through the blood of Jesus Christ. He is interested in you acknowledging him as the source of everything you have and giving him the best of it. Hallelujah. Let's give a more excellent sacrifice to God, not based on the need, not based or, or, or begrudgingly, but be cheerful about it. Thank God through it. Bless the name of the Lord. Father, we thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for challenging us. Lord God, to give from a place of faith, as Abel did, an excellent sacrifice through the blood of Jesus to get your righteousness, O oh God, a sacrifice that would continue to speak for us even when we are long departed. And not just speak anything, but speak better things. We thank you and we bless you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, precious people, God bless you. Have a good week. Until next time.